Hello, and I wanted to welcome you to a case presentation, or a workup that I'm going to be doing. We just saw this patient last week, and she is interested in aligner therapy. And I wanted to kind of show you um, a, a typical workflow for this. Now, this is a fairly advanced case, as you will see. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend this for beginners, but I wanted to give um, an example of how I look at things and how I plan my cases for um, in-house aligners. Um, I do Invisalign and I also make my in-house aligners and it just kind of depends on the case and what the patient's going for and I list basically the pros and cons of either uh, of each way plus the uh, different financials of each. And in this case, she decided she'd like to try the in-house aligners. So that's what we'll do. So here we go, starting out. Um, first thing that I see looking at things uh, through a myofunctional standpoint are her pursed lips. Kind of sucked in cheeks a little bit, pursed lips. Um, when I see that, I automatically kind of think um, that we're going to have teeth rolled into the lingual, that we're going to have a very narrow uh, buccal corridor. And so that's something that kind of jumps out to me here. On to the next slide. Um, her face is pretty decent, not too, uh, it's fairly flat. It's not concave, I would say, but I would definitely, when looking at something like this, I definitely wouldn't want to, I would want to avoid extractions if at all possible, because uh, I just see a further flattening or sinking in of the face with extraction cases. So looking at the profile, that's what jumps out to me. Uh, looking at her uh, head on, smile shot. Oh, speaking of, also ideally you would have, your assistants would have the, their hair tied back so you could see their ears and all of that stuff. So there we go. Okay, and so looking over here, um, see some staining of the teeth, might throw in some whitening on this. Um, other than rotation, or you know, other than crowding and misalignment, nothing really stands out. It looks like we might be deficient in the buccal corridor over here. Um, but incisal display, gingival display isn't, isn't too shabby, really. And they, we follow the lower lip line, so that's good. Okay, so now this is where things get interesting. Oh, also, I want to go back and note that her midline, her upper midline, is off to the right a couple millimeters compared to her facial midline. And I hope you see that there, because that's going to become pretty important here in just a minute. So, uh, we got to talk about hygiene control. You can see the staining and all that stuff. There's that narrow buccal corridor. You can see a lot of pink gingiva over here. Um, and then with the retracted shot, gingivitis, again, got to get this home care. Um, blocked out ca uh, canine right here. If you remember, the upper midline was a couple millimeters to the right um, compared to her facial midline. Well, here, her lower midline is even further to the right, about another millimeter. Um, so... That's something maybe we want to ch uh, change or correct. Maybe we don't. Um, I did talk with her about different treatment mechanics and different um, lengths of time, which I'll go through here in a little bit. Um, and we're going to be using kind of a compromised uh, setup, a little bit more heavy on IPR, uh, being okay with leaving stuff a bit class two versus going through the time and energy it would take to distalize molars to get things into more of an ideal class one situation and we'll go into that more here in just a minute so on the upper notice the uh, buccal tissue here lots of buccal tissue here right and that is a good sign that um we, can, we have some things available as far as uprighting teeth and expanding the arch laterally and our disposal. And that's going to help create room. When you look at upper your upper arch, if you see a lot of buccal uh, tissue, that tells you that you can probably expand to the lateral. However, if you already have 
Um, if you have a lot of crowding, but you don't see a lot of buckle tissue uh, when you take a take a look at your occlusal shot, um, that means you might be limited on how much you can achieve laterally. But here, um, it, with her being constricted and going back to her narrow corridors, um, it looks like we can get some good lateral development. Um, if you remember any of my other talks, or if you've um, seen me speak or anything, you know, I always kind of recap the ways that we can uh, make space in an arch, and I kind of I simplify it, like you can bring front teeth forward, so kind of in a frontal plane, you can move back teeth backwards, that's known as distalization. You can do, um, you can move the side teeth sideways, so that's lateral expansion of the arch. And those are the three ways that we can gain space within the arch uh, by moving teeth. But then there's also IPR, interproximal reduction, where we uh, create space uh, interproximally between the teeth. And then there's extraction, okay? Um, I already said I, I, want, I don't want to do extraction in this case um, because I don't want her profile flattening out even more. And so that's off the table. And then, of course, IPR is always going to be one. But then we, and she uh, wants to, she's not wanting to go through distalization because it'd take too long. Um, I think it'd be a great treatment if she was willing, if she was committed to do it, but she's not. So she knows that we're going to have to finish a little bit more class two and that we're going to be more reliant on IPR, um, but she's okay with that. So, uh, so moving back teeth backwards isn't, a prop, isn't um, an issue or isn't an option. So then we look at lateral development. How much lateral development can we get? And we can get a good amount. Um, this cavity right here has already been taken care of. Um, but we can get some uprighting and lateral development on the lowers. We certainly can on the uppers. So we do have lateral development um, available to us. And then lastly, um, a way to move teeth is bring front teeth forward, also known as proclination. But in this case, um, that's not really going to help us out a whole lot. Because if you see here, her lower incisors here, three of the four lower incisors, are already in a good position. They ha they're already nice and upright. They're within the neutral zone. They're not too far to the lingual. They're not too far to the labial. And so moving front teeth forward, especially on the lower arch, isn't really going to help us out much at all in this case. And then another thing I want you to think about. Whenever you see blocked out teeth or you see a midline discrepancy, um, that can be due to two sides of discrepancy, but also think about your molar position because oftentimes the molars are just too far mesial. Maybe they shed primary teeth a little bit too early um, and they weren't fitted for a space maintainer or whatever, but and so there is mesial drifting of the molars that ate up, um, ate up that space. But um, if you see a midline discrepancy, always be the lookout for molar position. And the same thing for blocked out teeth. So if her, if her midline was already two to three millimeters too far to the right, plus this canine over here is blocked out to the buckle, as you can see here, which side, which molars are actually more to blame? her left or her right? Well, the answer here is her left. Um, it's the contralateral side. These teeth are too far mesial, which ate up space that then made the uh, midline be over here and caused a crowding situation right here. So if we were doing distalization, I would be distalizing these teeth. I'd be moving these teeth backwards. Um, in this case, because she's not wanting to go through distalization, and there's only so much lateral development we'll be able to do, uh, that means I'm going to be re more reliant on IPR. And on the lower, I'm going to have to do more P IPR on this left side than on this right if I want to help walk this midline over a little bit. 
Here are the buckle mirror shots. Um, same thing. You can tell she doesn't have too much of an overbite. Um, she socked in class one pretty well on her right side, but she's class two, half step class two on her left. Again, um, one of the things I really uh, hammer home is uh, is the uh, six keys of occlusion, and her six keys of occlusion, and really look at these premolars, where they're at in relation to this embrasure. And, here, this cusp should be in this embrasure. This cusp should be in this embrasure, and they're not. So here, they're a, they're about a half step class two. And so what that also means is if we're going to be working this midline over, and we're going to be doing more IPR over here, then that means we're going to have to also do more IPR on the left side on the upper as well. And then you always want to ask yourself, am I, is, is a goal trying to achieve a class one relationship? And in this case, because she wasn't willing to commit to the time uh, that it would take to dislize teeth and really sock in a class one occlusion, we are going to be leaving it class two a bit. So here are her, um, another, just another shot of her models. Here's her pano. Um, nothing really to report. She's already had her thirds out, so that's handy. Now, looking at her Ceph, um, one, a couple things that pointed that jumped out to me. Her A and B is five, which is a skeletal class two, which isn't all that surprising since we, uh, since she is class two dental as well. But if you look at where the red arrow is at, GOG and SN, or also known as the mandibular plane angle, that is almost 45 degrees. That is rather open. Um, also known as a clockwise grower, or vertical grower, there's all sorts of different ways to, to say it. But basically she has a, a tendency to want to have an open bite in the anterior. So that's something that we're gonna to have to take into consideration as we move these teeth because she already doesn't have a ton of overbite and patients will always tolerate having a little bit more overbite than having an open bite. So just a heads up and then uh, on the next part let's go through an actual um, workup in Blue Sky Plan. Okay, gang, so now we have Blue Sky Bio set up, and we're going to trim the models real quick, and I will speed through some of this stuff, because it'd be pretty boring to watch me segment the teeth, but we always want to start off by cleaning up the models. You don't need, for aligners, you don't need all this palette. I still have my girls scan to get the palette. It helps with cross arch um, accuracy of the scan. And also if you're ever needing to do an expander or something like that, it would you would want those you'd want that palette information. I want to show you something real quick here. By going to tools and going to preferences, if you go through here and you uh, put hollow models and generate cross pattern, that's going to be pretty nice. Um, in order to save on having to hollow them out later and it's really going to cut down on your resin so just a heads up there okay now I'm going to go back and um, speed through this because you don't need to be bored by this so here you go
right, gang. So here we're going to get started. Now, in this case, after further review with the patient and the distalization mechanics that would really need to happen, I don't, I am not um, convinced or confident that she is up for that level of treatment and time commitment. So we're going to, we're going to take a, we're going to reverse gears here and I am going to not do distalization um, of the molars. So she is going to still finish a bit more, um, she's going to still finish class two a bit, but we're going to try to camouflage that a little bit through um, IPR. Still address the midline issue. Again, if you remember that midline was off to the right uh, to her face, so we are going to be doing more IPR on the left. But let's go ahead and get this lower arch established first, and then go from there. So, first things first, these teeth are rolled in a little bit and derotated. So we can we can upright these teeth a bit to help create space. And then I know that I'll need to do IPR. And so we're going to be planning that from the get-go as well. Now I'll need IPR on both sides since we're not wanting to go through distalization. Now, you know how I talked to you about you the what are the ways to uh, gain space, right? You can move front teeth forward, you can move back teeth backwards, you can move the side teeth sideways, you can IPR, or you can extract. So we've, ex we've uprighted the teeth, we've got lateral development, so that'll help, right? In this case, she is not down for the time commitment that it's going to take to distalize teeth, so that's out of the question. So we've talked about two um, ways now. Front, so the other one is front teeth coming forward. But here's the thing. Her front teeth right now, these three incisors, they're in a good position. I mean, they're upright, they're not flared forward, they're not flared lingual, or they're not um, retracted lingual. They're in a good position right now, and they're established with, uh, within the neutral zone. So it's not like I can just bring these forward because then that is going to get them outside of that neutral zone and our results probably aren't going to be all that stable. So that is just, that's something to consider, okay? Now, I'm going to maximize how much IPR I can do here on this left side. And basically, I stick to a rule of 0.5 millimeters. Here, you're going to see me go 0.65. That's what I'm shooting for. But I'm actually only going to um, plan on 0.5. By quote unquote over IPRing, but not actually doing that much, uh, that's kind of analogous to um, like a virtual power chain. Like if you're familiar with Invisalign, how they have a virtual power chain um, setting in there, it's kind of similar to that. So I, I'm i going to be planning on 0 0.5, uh, 0.5 millimeters of IPR from molar to distal of canine, okay? Now, I'll need to do the same thing on the upper as well. Now, if it turns out that I don't need that much, then great. Okay, cool. But I'm going to go ahead and plan on it.
Okay, so through that, we've been able to gain enough space, really, to bring in this canine. I'm not really going to plan on doing much IPR on the right, on the lower then. Check what I'm doing right here. Now, I am overcorrecting. I'm putting tons of distal root tip on this tooth, right? Why am I doing that? because I know I'm not actually going to achieve that much distal root tip. But, that's what I want to over exaggerate in the treatment plan. So, okay, I'm not gonna be planning on doing this IPR over here because I'm over correcting for that distal root tip. Now we have space and we can actually back up on how much IPR that we did. Because I would rather leave the midline off of the face a little bit, considering that wasn't even a chief complaint of hers. And I, don't even, I really don't even bring up midline to the patients a whole lot. Because people, with, and it's been well documented, that people just don't notice it. Unless if you bring it to their attention. Okay, so really that looks pretty good. And again, I would only be planning on 0.5 um, millimeters on uh, interproximally between the molars. So really, that's not too that's not too shabby. Okay. And then when we look at this, so. I am going to be planning on uh, trying to upright these teeth a little bit, intruding them even some just a bit. And the reason being is because if you remember looking back at her case, she uh, has the potential to be open bite. And so I would rather finish the case a little bit on the deep end rather than give her an open bite. So now I've got the open, uh, now I've got the lower finished. Now we're going to fit the upper to it. And again, I'm going to leave her a bit class two. Um, I am going to, I'm going to get the uh, uppers, I'm going to IPR a bit more on the uppers. Distalize a little bit. Not going for full class one molar relationship by any means. So just a side note, because I'm trying to more bodily move these teeth, I am going to be putting vertical attachments 
on those. Torque attachments on that one. I used to try to shy away from attachments, but now I've really embraced attachments. Um, once you learn how to do them and learn how much better they make your treatment outcomes um, and can streamline your treatment, um, I've learned to embrace them. I used to try to avoid them at all costs, but now. Not so much. So now that I've got sagittal pretty well taken care of, we can also expand a bit, which is what I'm going to go ahead and do now. Okay, so now that we've gotten room for everything to be straight, let's take a look against the opposing and see how much overjet we have. So right now we still have a good amount of overjet, more than I would care for. So what we're going to need to do is IPR both sides so we can have room to retract teeth back and decrease this over jet. Like I said before, we don't want to completely, completely overclose or like restrict the anterior envelope, but we're going to need enough. If you see how this is starting to get that midline back on relative to each other, And these are a little bit too upright. I am going to bring these out just a little bit. We want a bit, of, a little bit of palatal, um, palatal root torque on these. Want a little bit of proclination. Okay, midline is finishing pretty farewell on. Need to get this a little bit more. I would still want to mind just a little bit more proclination, just slightly. And again, I'm going to plan on finishing this case slightly on the closed side, just because I don't want to open that up too much. Equilibrate the IPR a little bit. Give it just enough to register. There we go. Okay, that looks pretty darn good to start. We may have to refine a little bit, but honestly, we may not have to. 
let's take a look at bite mapping. Now this can take a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and save. Alright. Alright, so showing heavy on the molars. Not too shabby though. Okay, so looking at this, um, it is saying 33 steps for the lowers, and we'll walk through those. Okay, so looking at this, a few things that we're going to need to do. Any teeth that need to be laterally moved or uh, uprighted, like this tooth is going to need root torque. We won't be looking at that to start thinking about what attachments we're going to need. Like see these lower incisors here, how they are having to move. But to get that movement, aligners only push, right? You know, and that's so. If a force is having to push this tooth this way, there's not a whole lot. You know, there's not a whole lot of surface area for that tooth to work with. On this one, it has this surface here, but this one doesn't really have any surface for the aligner to push against. So on cases like this, I'm going to be using um, vertical attachments on teeth like that. Um, I'm going to be using vertical attachments or root torque attachments, we'll see, on that canine. I'll probably do a vertical attachment just because um, it'll help me rotate that teeth that tooth as well as give me fulcrum for distal uh, for torquing that root distal um, that's about it I'll probably put some um, on the molar and first molar and second premolar I'll probably put some horizontal um, attachments for anchorage But that's about it. So we're looking at 33, 34 steps um, right there. So so we're looking at maybe 17 months to get the lower established, so a year and a half. And the upper is going to be even more. Um, so let's take a look at that. All right, so this is where we're finishing. Oh, okay, less steps on the uh, upper. I, I kind of forgot because I wasn't distalizing. My original plan was to distalize and it's going to take forever on top. But without distalizing, no, we're only going to have uh, 30 steps or so, so not too shabby. So yeah, we're looking at probably a year and a half case. Um, really depends on compliance and also if we need to, how much fine tuning we need to do at the end. Okay, cool. Want to save these under treatment simulations? And I'll do the same thing for the lower as well.
All right, cool. So we will be adding buttons here. <laughs> so we'll switch that to add brackets. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, again, if we look at original position, which is going to show in this gray, you can see these teeth, we've had to move to the distal here, right? But there's not a whole lot of, there's not a whole lot of surface area to achieve those. So I would be planning Vertical, vertical, vertical. Mm, probably even the vertical on here too. Um, well, I'm either going to do root torque or vertical on this canine. And I'll probably do horizontal attachments back here. So let's go ahead and do that so you can see what that looks like. Add button. I'm going to go with standard usually. And then if you see from here, so this tooth is gonna to have to be, this aligner is gonna to have to push from this direction right here. So I'm gonna make that a little bit more perpendicular of a force. A little bit more. See that? So it's gonna be a little bit more perpendicular to the surface of that tooth. And it's just gonna add a little bit more oomph a little bit more surface area for that to be on. I want to embed it enough into the tooth that we don't have any gap there. Okay, there we go. We're going to do the same thing over here. Add previous button. I am going to rotate it. Okay, now, for a little bit more anchorage, oh, let's see, want to shrink this down just a little bit. I'm giving this a platform to snap on, if you see that. So that way the aligner will come down here, grip, and that will act as a really good anchorage. Again, we just want to make sure we don't have any problems there. Okay. So now let's take a look at this one. This canine is going to be the trickiest out of all of them. Um, so we could do a couple of different things. We could add two so in your optimized alright Okay, so if we're going to use root control attachments, I'll show you what it looks like, even though I would be using, um, I'm probably going to use a vertical attachment here. But just to kind of show you, um, we may just do this for root um, uh, torque control attachment. But anyways, you use two of these, okay? And you're usually going to have one on the incisal, one on the gingival, and they point to these bevels are on the outside so they go to the mesial and they go to the distal and whichever 
So, and then it just really depends on which way you need to torque the root. So if you need to torque the root distal, then your distal attachment is going to be on the incisal and your mesial attachment is going to be on the gingival and then vice versa. And what this does is if you imagine how my uh, a force pushing on this bevel here is going to tip, want to tip that root mesially on the incisal and then vice versa, a force coming down from the mesial towards the distal hitting this bevel is going to want to push the uh, gingival portion of this crown to the distal and so force up top to the mesial here force the distal down here and that's going to create a fulcrum effect to torque your root out down here so that is how we would put it and let's just make sure everything looks good all right there we go Let's give that a try for documentation purposes. Why not? Okay. Then on the maxillary, let's take a look see here. Won't need as many attachments, but I'm still going to do a few. So let's show initial position. So I will do a couple of anchorage attachments on at least the, one, the second premolars, and I will do I will do more vertical attachments through here because we are going to be distalizing through IPR, and here because this tooth is going to be rotated and it's kind of swinging this way, so we will use a good amount of attachments here. Like I said, don't be afraid of attachments. Really don't. And kind of get over that because they they really do make your life easier once you get to get to really learn them. And you want it pretty well with the long axis of the root. I put it straight center unless if there's certain rotation effects that I'm trying to achieve, but in this case I don't really see the need for much of that. Now I'm not planning on doing it on the lateral and I'll show you why. So on this lateral here we're going to be retracting this back because it's kind of a tipping reclination type um, movement the tray has this whole buckle surface to push on and so that's a lot of surface area I just don't see the need for um, attachments on that on those areas so there we go hopefully that helps and now we'll export these okay and now let's show a label and so 30 trays up top And then at this point, if you're going to be doing platforms for vertical printing, be sure to do this part right here. Do not forget that part. Now that will create a lot of headache for you and your printer whatever that may be in your team so do 
not forget that step. Okay, here we go. Okay, now I want to show you what the uh, prints look like and how I'm going to print them on the Moonray S. Now, these are one of those times that, man, I wish I had a Moonray Pro because that thing is cool. Okay, so there we go. Um, I'll add some more, but that's kind of how I set these up to vertical print. Um, probably be able to get one more back here. I may be able to get some to the side. We'll see. So, But that'll probably be it. I'll probably do two prints, one for the uppers and one for the lowers. But anyway, so that's how I stack them, and there you go. So I hope you enjoyed this, kind of going through the workflow and everything and hope you find it valuable and um, stay tuned for as the case updates and then of course if you uh, would like to learn more hands-on um, feel free to check out my website Dr. Standridge that's D-R-S-T-A-N-D-R-I-D-G-E so Dr. Standing on a Ridge and uh, for more information course updates and stuff like that so take care